Hello, everyone, and welcome to How to Ignite Your Imagination, Intuition, and Inspiration, and Do Your Best Creative Work. My name is Susie DeVille, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Innovation and Creativity Institute, and I help entrepreneurs work lighter while making higher profits by tapping into their innate creativity. And I'm also the author of Buoyant, the entrepreneur's guide to becoming wildly successful, creative, and free. And I wrote Buoyant for entrepreneurs who are painfully stuck and riddled with self-doubt, who believe that the path to the success and freedom they crave is through more work, more productivity, more discipline. And what they may not realize is that the easier path is through accessing their unbridled, inspired creativity. And I am so thrilled to be with you today and to have the world's most bodacious, brilliant, beautiful mentor on earth. And I'm going to bring her in right now. This is Miss AJ Harper. Woo! <laughs> so good for my ego, I swear. <laughs> Everything I say about AJ is true. And, and if you saw any of the promotion that I did for this live stream, one of the things that I say to her via chat all the time is there's nobody like you. And it's true. And by the time we finish with this uh, webinar for you today, you're going to be saying the exact same thing. So welcome, my dear. I'm so, I'm so glad you're here. We're going to have a great conversation. Yes. So I want to begin with a formal introduction of the greatness who is sitting before you so that you can learn all about her incredible expertise and experience. AJ Harper is an editor and publishing strategist who helps authors write transformational books that enable them to build readership grow their brand, and make a significant impact on the world. As ghostwriter and as developmental editor, she has worked with hundreds of authors from newbies to New York Times bestselling authors with millions of books sold. AJ teaches her method in top three book workshop and the must read editing workshop. She is the head writing coach for Heroic Public Speaking, the premier speaking training program created by Michael and Amy Port. She is writing partner to business author Mike Michalowicz. Together, they've written nine books, <laughs> including Profit First. AJ is the author of Write a Must Read, Craft a Book that Changes Lives, including your own. Isn't it beautiful? It is pretty. <laughs> and you can connect with AJ at ajharper.com. And I will be giving you um, lots more information and put things on the screen as we go forward so that you know how to um, get in touch with her as well as perhaps take her amazing workshops. Um, so I want to begin with one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite philosophers and poets, John O'Donohue. And he says, when your mind awakens, your life comes alive and the creative adventure of your soul takes off. So that's what AJ and I are going to be talking about today. This journey of going from stuck to really tapping into your inspired creativity, to igniting your imagination, and doing the work that you so crave to do in the world. So AJ, I'm going to start by sort of mapping out the landscape of what the problem is, and then we're going to talk about the solutions. So here we go. I'm going to go to my document camera. Okay. And apologies for the chicken scratch. <laughs> 
So I want to begin with where most entrepreneurs and creators and writers start this process of going from some this idea, this desire to create something in the world, and then ending up here, stuck and blocked. So generally speaking, what happens is we begin with some kind of notion of imposter syndrome, this belief that I'm not enough or my work is not good enough. And that tends to give rise to perfectionism and pessimism, which then paralyzes us with this fear of judgment and also self-doubt. This fuels our gerbil wheel activity, overachieving this desire to try to outwork the sense that we're not good enough. And that, of course, depletes us and burns us out, which fuels our desire to try to even work harder, reach for more productivity, and ultimately lands us in the zone of stuck and blocked. So let me come back now, and I'm going to bring AJ back in. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> I know we all have had in some um, way or another, everybody has dealt with this business of being stuck or blocked, separated from this ability to access our inspired creativity. So what I'd like to do is ask you to talk about it from the perspective of the world of writers. And that one term that we hear all the time, writer's block. So tell me first, what is it? What is writer's block? And is it real? Is it a real thing? Uh, well, it's staring at a blank page, not coming up with anything. And then that continues for a period of time. So it could be something that you feel blocked one day or even for an hour or five minutes. But we tend to associate it with longer periods. It, we, we tend to not say it unless we're stuck in it. Um, so if we have a bad day, we might not say writer's block. If we have a bad month, we definitely say writer's block. The thing is, it's a total lie. It's absolutely not real. It feels very real. I'm not diminishing how people feel. But when we call it writer's block, we give it power that it doesn't have. And it's not real. It's just a... a are we don't realize that it's not something that we can fix that feeling of being of facing the blank page there's never a time when it's uh going to be fixed forever and i that's not did not originate with me i learned that from stephen pressfield when he explained that concept of resistance mm -hmm. uh, which is the part that really clicked for me was when he explained that it was a law of nature like gravity once I understood that, I realized, oh, this is a this is a total myth because when you believe in writer's block, then you believe in all you try to all the cures, and you feel bad that you can't kick it. And every time it happens to you again, you think, what did I do wrong? So by realizing, hey, this is just something that happens like gravity, and it's always going to come back like gravity, like gravity's there. And it frees you up from feeling like you did something wrong. So what has been your own experience with having temporary moments of the inability of accessing your writing talents? I love how you're avoiding the term, like, let's call it not writer's, writer's book. <laughs> I mean, I, I've had years, but that's when I believed in it. And, uh, you know, the, I've always dealt with the same thing everybody deals with, which is facing, uh, I, what am I, what's the point of writing this? And I don't know what to say. And I don't know how to start. That's usually it. And who's going to care? And I don't know how to do this. But it really got bad for me when I got a bad review for a play. And that sent me into, I mean, if you, if you already have imposter syndrome, 
or just self-doubt, which by the way, all writers feel it. I firmly believe this is why so many writers are driven to substance abuse, frankly. Um, we just want to get into that flow. So we want to block all the things that prevent us from flow. And we end up in these tricky situations using alternate means. Um, not me personally, but many writers. And if you already think why, why, sh who's going to listen. And then someone says what you did was terrible, <laughs> then it's just evidence. And that put me into a funk. It was years. It was actually years. And it was, it's devastating. And I think, you know, the feeling can be applicable even if you're not a writer, if you're not feeling inspired as an entrepreneur. I mean, that's one of the things I love so much about Buoyant, your book, is um, that creative, entrepreneurs are creative. Otherwise, we would be in a regular job. And we like to make things. And you lose that spark over time and you start to doubt yourself. And that's what I love about Buoyant is it helps you tap, tap into that. But it can feel really devastating when you're stuck. And that was true for me when I was stuck for years. You miss it. You just miss doing, being creative. And so how did you find your way out? You men mentioned uh, Stephen Pressfield. What was your path out of the dark woods? So that time, I, I didn't know about Stephen Pressfield at that time. Uh, what I did was I went back to something that had worked for me before, which was focusing on a regular writing habit and based on quantity, not quality. And I do talk about this in my own book, and you know this story as well. I remembered a time when I, I focused on quantity completion every day versus, or every writing day, to be clear. You don't have to write every day uh, to be a writer. But every day that I had decided to write, I focused on a page. At the time, it was pages because when you write plays, you can get through them really fast. Um, and so I remembered that. And I missed writing so much. So I just forced myself to come home, uh, to come go to Borders Bookstore, which is now gone in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is where I lived at the time. After work, I would pull in there, order a latte, and force myself to write five pages of anything. And over time, that practice, I mean, it really isn't instant. It was a process, um, brought me back to the creative spark. And so in your book, your beautiful principle of putting reader first, I believe is also a wonderful way to either break out of being stuck mm -hmm or reach new depths of your inspired creativity. Can you talk a little bit about what that concept is and how it could apply to um, tapping into something that you didn't even know was there? Thank you for that. Uh, reader, reader First is a shorthand for what I believe that a book is not about something, it's for someone. <clears throat> And so, as you know, in workshop, that's our shorthand. We say reader first, reader first. And it's a reminder that we're writing for a specific reader and to think about them the whole way through. How it works when you have, when you're blocked is it cuts through that imposter syndrome because now you're in service. So, oh, I'm writing this to help somebody this would really be useful for them. I could make a difference for them. I got I to gotta keep trucking. Um, let me see how I can stay in service. And whenever we get out of that mindset of self-focused, whether we think if this is, is good enough and we focus instead on how can I be helpful, it's an almost immediate way to get back into the page. It is instant relief. <laughs> And I can tell a story. I think it was, I was either the on, on the fifth or sixth draft of my book. And I was trying to figure out this one key piece of how some of the content in my book related to my coaching methodology, which I call the creative rebels voyage. And everything was mapping exactly the way that I wanted it to map with how I was introducing concepts in the book but then there was this one place where the record skipped. 
<laughs> and I couldn't figure it out. And I just, I like, I had things pasted all over the walls, like some kind of mad woman. And I was pacing around trying, talking to myself, <laughs> trying to figure it out. And there were two things that really brought me the clarity and this lovely sense of kind of coming home to myself. And that was returning to my reader and then also engaging in making something. So I did, I, I did what I talk about in the book. I was like, oh, right. I did talk about that. I did I teach this. <laughs> Maybe I should try it. So I engaged in making something while I had my ideal reader top of mind. And it was just like, whoosh, everything came. I love that. Instant relief. <laughs> so um, one of the things that you um, offer to your readers in your book is this notion of having multiple passes for editing. And to me, it is like the other side of the coin or the other bookend of the reader first principle in that it's another opportunity to go to let yourself off the hook first of all during the creative writing process and then to be able to come back and know you're going to catch all the things mm -hmm. so why is a multiple editing pass such a great asset to a writer so um most of us don't, you know, when you're a new writer, it part of, and by the way, this also in, influences that stuck feeling when the process is a mystery. So if you can demystify the process and understand how it works and get to know craft and learn um, sequencing and, and how things all work, then it's, you're less likely to be afraid of it because you aren't constantly worrying that you're doing something wrong, right? And one of the problems with editing is if you think writing a first draft is a mystery, editing is a huge mystery. Most people don't know the process, how many people are involved, what to expect from editors. And they're usually not prepared to deal with a developmental editor who is the person who does the big picture stuff to make sure the book actually works. They don't really know what to expect from that. And if they skip that person, they really don't know what to expect. So when they sit down to edit themselves, all that imposter stuff keeps com com just roaring in because now you wrote something, but you don't think it's any good. And the truth is it probably isn't. And you just need to make it better through editing. The challenge is uh, developmental editors can look at a document and do a pa first pass, which is starting from word one all the way to the end. They can handle that. Uh, but the average person who hasn't, been through the process and doesn't do this day in and day out, doesn't know how to hold space for all the different things you have to think about, like consistency, tone, um, tracking the reader journey, uh, making sure that there's no friction, making sure that everything is doable. Uh, is the sequencing right? I mean, there's a myriad issues to consider. So I broke it down into dealing with them one at a time. So rather than taking your whole book and starting from the first word and then trying to do all the things at the same time, it's just looking at parts of your book, fixing those things, and just going through a checklist systematically so that once you're done with that, you can do that full read through, but now you've fixed all those issues and you can see the book as a whole. And I think that eliminates a lot of fear because it's just a systematic process that shows you how to do it again demystifying it it was such a relief for me um and i am a natural compartmentalizer <laughs> and so i took to this like a duck in a lake and i was so delighted because i could put aside so many things and stay off of that mental gerbil wheel of, oh my gosh, I forgot, or oh my gosh, did I, did I check the other? I just could focus on one thing at a time. And it really took me over the bridge 
um, from self-doubt to self-trust because I could just relax into my own material, remembering to keep my reader first and just checking the things off the list. It was just following a recipe at that point. <laughs> So I want to go back to the document camera here for a second, and we're going to talk about some uh, solutions here that are art-based. And don't don't have a don't have a heart attack on me. Don't 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 click off. <laughs> but I want to prove something to you today, and there is going to be an interactive part of this webinar that is going to absolutely blow your mind. So hang in there. I want to talk about the solutions to everything that um, AJ and I have been talking about from the perspective of how I write about it in my book, Buoyant. So if we can begin with just a willingness to believe that the success and freedom that we crave is possible for us, that is really all you need. If you have that and you have this <laughs> and you have this, <laughs> I, then AJ and I can take you right up here to the promised land. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the power of inspiration. And what I mean by inspiration is literally the breathing in of beauty, art, nature, what brings you, brings you alive, doing what you love, being with the people you love. And that inspired action is really what can fuel us through any ebbs and flows of our creative work as, as writers, as entrepreneurs, as creators of all stripes. And I have codified this in an easy way to access it. And I call it the five M's. And they, that stands for morning pages, a la Julia Cameron of The Artist's Way. And that's three pages of longhand writing every day. Meditation which can be as simple as just five minutes in quiet, noticing your breathing. Movement, and this can be something that you can do um, as a walk or as a bike ride or um, exercises from your chair. Moments of inspired learning. This again can be as simple as just listening to one minute of a poet recites their poetry. And I do this on a regular basis. And the last M, this is the one that everybody fights me on. <laughs> this is the one that everybody resists and that's making something. My hard charging entrepreneurial clients get livid when I start to suggest that they make something as a path to success and freedom. So, and this is going to be your experience today too, I imagine. <laughs> um, but I'm going to prove you wrong today. We're going to do a very brief exercise. It's going to, only going to be three minutes. But this is the place where we start to howl with words like, I'm not an artist. I'm not creative. My sister's creative, but I'm not. Um, who has time to make stuff that sounds like stuff for retired people or people who are crafty or um, this is not for me. I'm busy. Um, this is the place that fully fuels and spins the inspired action wheel. And it helps us to remember what brings us alive, which takes us further into creating an art making on a different level, on a deeper level. This takes us to this willingness again, to what AJ was just talking about, quantity over quality. And here, once we start to produce work, we start to have a greater tolerance for uncertainty. This makes us optimistic, which gives us the impetus and the musculature for bold action, which is a wonderful way to douse burnout and release perfectionism. And from there, we land on self-trust, which gives us confidence, clarity, and alignment with our true self, our reader, and our market. So let me come back. 
So I want to do a fun exercise now. And I'm going to show you how easy this is going to be. You have to just take a look around very quickly, pick up one thing on your desk. I'm going to show you what I'm grabbing. This is the little pot that I use for water when I'm doing painting. Just going to grab one little pot. I'm going to take a piece of paper and I'm literally going to do it on AJ's bio. So don't get precious about your materials. And I'm going to actually use a fountain pen. <gasps> I'm going to do it in ink. <laughs> but you can do this with a marker, a crayon, a pencil, a pen, anything you want. And here's how it's going to work. First, I want you to acknowledge the fact that you're probably a little bit uncomfortable right now. <laughs> And maybe not a little bit annoyed with me because I'm asking you to draw something. <laughs> but everybody who I take through this process has a very similar transformational journey. We start out on the other side of the art making moment with some irritation and some mind stuff. Then we start to focus our attention on the object that we're drawing. And we notice something start to shift inside of our bodies. We start to calm down. Then we start to almost become connected and merged with the object of our attention. And we're going to notice perhaps how often we don't stop and really observe things in our lives. And then you're off and running. Now, if you are howling in frustration that you don't know how to sketch, you do know how to sketch. All you have to do is look. The end product is irrelevant. We do not care what the quote unquote quality of it is. You may love it. You may be incredibly proud of it. <laughs> but the point is not the end product. The point is what's happening to you when you're making something and moving these. So if you don't have something nearby or on your desk, just draw your hand, okay? And we're going to just do three minutes and then we're going to wrap it up. So just take a moment now and start your sketch.
I have a few more seconds. Okay. So AJ, tell me, can you hold it up a little bit? Look at that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so tell me what happened in your body. As much as I love this. Oh, I can't hear you. Hold on. I muted you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want to know what this is? <laughs> I can't, I, I don't know. It's a tiny know. little vase on my desk that my friend Brooke gave me that has a Venus flytrap in it. <laughs> it's gone completely unruly now uh, because she wanted me to remember to not be so nice all the time. Mm. Um, <laughs> but can I just interrupt you for a minute and say how awesome it is that you had all of us on a webinar drawing for three minutes? <laughs> I just think you're fantastic. Like, no oh. one does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So what, you can ask me all the things now. <laughs> well, I'm curious. So what was your before state? What was going through your mind? Well, uh, you know, I'm generally happy to be in conversation with you. So I was enjoying the conversation. I was slightly nervous because I'm that kid that the teacher said, uh, you probably aren't, you probably shouldn't, you're not an artist. You probably shouldn't draw anymore. Let's give you something else to do. So I was slightly apprehensive, but generally in a good place because I'm talking to you. Well, that's interesting. Um, I do want to point out that a lot of us resist doing even just a quick sketch or anything else, quote unquote, creative, because we have what Brene Brown calls creativity scars. And these are experiences that happen to us as young children. Someone made fun of something that we made or a parent said something or a teacher said something. And from that moment on, we just believe that that world is not accessible by us. The person who could draw the horse that looks like a horse, that's the artist. And me, who draw the who drew the horse that looks like a coffee table, <laughs> is not an artist. And you believe it. Mm -hmm. I believed it for decades, decades. And this is true for all of us. And associated with that is some kind of little annoying foundation of shame around it. And it has an ability to send toxic tendrils into our work in ways that we're not even aware of. And it's important to remember too that, so my definition of creativity is this swirling force of potentiality that exists in all of us. And if it's dammed up or stuffed down or ignored, it's not benign. In fact, it is and can be toxic. It can be physically toxic. It can be something that erodes our confidence in our work and other ways and our sense of self overall. So tell me now, so now you, you cross the membrane <laughs> and into the work. What happened then? I just, I just got into it and tried my best. I have, but I have confidence in what you're saying. I mean, I've read your book. <laughs> I've read your book several times and I know that um, from what you what you describe and from the results you describe that there's a gateway for me so I trusted you implicitly what's interesting is I don't think I normally would stop to do this in a work day but I mean I just did it on a post-it and it's that's exactly how you should grab a piece of paper and just go for it. I love the way Emily Dickinson would take the backs of used envelopes and a little stubby pencil and she would write these beautiful poems. And my interpretation of that is, is that she just was trying to make the tools, as Stephen Pressfield would say, not precious. And she would just start to go to town. I chose your bio 
for a very specific reason because it's it already had marks on it. <laughs> so even though I do this all the time, staring at that blank page, whether we're starting to draft out the first iteration of our website or the first draft of our sales copy or the first draft of our book or a presentation, that first part of the process is always a moment of hesitation. And if we hesitate then, it tends to kind of keep us further away from the work for a longer period of time. But if we just grab something and start to go, it just, one thing leads to another. This is how your intuition starts to wake up and say, maybe take it, take it this direction or maybe add in this idea. We can't access it from a place of being in animate. We can't access it if we're not engaged in the doing. And the quality of the doing is irrelevant. As you point out in your beautiful book, we can always go back and fix it. But you can't get to those golden nuggets of creative expression if you're not willing to get it wrong and if you're not willing to just surrender into the work and embrace the uncertainty rather than fight against it, which is totally what my <laughs> first and second and third inclination is to do. <laughs> so I want to um, shift gears now into something that I talk about in my book that I call the creative circadian rhythms. And this notion is just like we have circadian rhythms with how we go through periods of activity and rest and so forth within our own bodies that are influenced by time changes and seasons and so forth. We also have this moment, and it could be more than one moment during the day. I know several people who have multiple um, windows of, of high creative energy and output. Um, but my way of describing this is that it's the time of day where you are, your most connected to yourself. You are most able to access that sort of elusive connection to creative divinity and how you can actually take that knowledge and leverage it to your highest and best, um, ability. So let me start first with asking you, AJ, what is your best time of day to do your creating? When are you most connected? I would say probably around four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, like you, I'm usually up before the sun. But there's also, um, you know, I like the afternoon when there's nothing ahead of it. So uh, as long as I know I've got nowhere to be, I, I do like the afternoon to just putter. I call it puttering. So I'll just look at stuff, maybe clean something, walk around my house, listen to something, and then I will settle down. Kind of like an animal that sort of like circles. Mm -hmm. um, so if I have a full afternoon, that's magic to me. So you, you pointed out several things that I think are fascinating. One is you have more than one window mm -hmm. of high creative output or multiple creative circadian rhythm windows. And two, your latter window is a time when it feels, to, I can almost even feel you processing mm -hmm. <laughs> as you're cleaning and pacing and walking, you know, and this is um, our preparatory phase that we go into. I do this all the time myself. I will wake up very early and I want to make clear, you can have a circadian, uh, a creative circadian rhythm window that is from 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. I'm not advocating that you have to get up at the crack of dawn to find yours. But um, I will start out very early in the morning 
And, and if I have a huge creative project, I will do just as AJ described. I will have all of these kind of rituals in place of organizing, cleaning, thinking, and I'm, I'm processing just, just below the surface of what I'm going to do and how I'm going to approach it. But I'm physically in motion. That is a key thing for me. And it may very well be for you too, AJ. Just, we're engaging both sides of the brain by being in motion. And so if you find yourself lagging or unable to really f- put your arms around your, your, your creativity and your ability to um, access it, take a nap <laughs> or um, go outside for a walk or tackle the laundry and start thinking about something else because your subconscious mind is working that problem all in the background. So being in motion is a wonderful way to keep, um, keep your finger on the pulse. So I would be interested for people to take a minute now and think about the time of day for you. What is your window of time? And generally speaking, it's about a four hour window with some, some ramping up and some um, ramping down time. And that four hours or so is really where we're on fire. And just write it down what you, what you think it is for you right now and whether or not there's a second sort of burst of energy and clarity that you have during the day. And my homework assignment for you is to test it now over the course of two weeks, just take notice of how that window is or is not true for you and start to experiment a little bit. Start it a little earlier or, or come, uh, keep going a little bit later. What are you noticing? Take down some ideas because you will start to, you will start to number one, protect that time a lot better because you're much more aware of it, but also you might be able to find, as a lot of my clients find, is that it's not exactly what we thought it, it was. I used to think the definitive definitive for me was four to 10 or four to, to, to eight or four to nine, something like that. And <laughs> what I found, unfortunately, is that it's really more like three to seven. Um, and I found that through meditation on being on a, um, a meditation retreat. Now, again, I don't want you all to just be horrified that you have to do an early, early, early start to your day to get to it. Lots of people have them in the middle of the day, at the end of the day, whatever. It's completely unique to you, but experiment around and test it. Let's see what happens. Um, so Miss AJ, I'm curious as we are starting to wrap up a little bit here, what is your number one tip for writers and aspiring authors? What, what, if you had to start it all over, what, what is the wisdom that you wish that you had? I think the, I wanted, I would just say, try it. So something that I've noticed in teaching is that um, people will come to me and say, I wonder if I should do this, or I'm thinking about this as if it's make or break. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it's not, I mean, it could, it might never see the light of day. You can just do it for yourself. So it's funny how that simple, it sounds easy enough that why, why would this be my top advice? Because people don't do it. People don't just say, what if I did this? And then go do it. There's almost a, an, there's a need for reassurance and permission. And uh, it's not set in stone. Just try the thing. You want to write it in, write something in first person or third person. Try both. You think the story should start here or there. Try both. Um, you want to play with convention. You want to think of, think through a scene. You want to write your whole thing in verse. Try it. The worst thing that can happen is you'll realize it's not working, but uh, there's an unwillingness and you used that word willingness earlier, but there's an unwillingness to just try for fear of, again, it's all about 
feeling like we're going to get it wrong. But the creative process is layered and it builds. So even just trying to write something that didn't work informs the next thing you write. And so it's never, ever wasted. That's what I would say. Just try. Oh, that's wonderful advice. And I love your point that your first efforts are always going to inform your next move, what you're going to be doing next. And I think that so many of us, and, and I definitely admit <laughs> this too, we want, when I'm starting something new, we want to be able to see, I want to see steps one through 50. <laughs> um, I want to understand how it's supposed to go from one to five. And, um, and then how does it, you know, relate to the latter part of the process? And um, otherwise, I feel like I've, I've just, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. Well, we don't, none of us have any idea. Newsflash, none of us know what we're doing. Um, and the sooner we embrace that feeling of freedom and just this deliciousness of being open to how the universe rearranges itself the minute we start, then the resources and the ideas and the next step and the imagination catches fire and the intuition comes online and then we're off and going. So I love, I love your advice so much. I also have a, my favorite tip for writers and aspiring authors is this. <laughs> so I want to encourage everyone who has um, been working on a manuscript or dreams of working on one or wants to know more about the publishing process to go to AJ's site, ajharper.com, and you're going to read about this amazing workshop called the Top Three Book Workshop. And it's a 14 week workshop. And you can begin wherever you are. <laughs> I started with a first draft, um, but it was like a drippy, muddy blob of clay. And I had to really sort out what was going to work, what wasn't going to work. And, and I was completely clueless about the entire process of how to really zone in on connecting with your ideal reader and formulating your core message and um, making sure that I was bringing in all of my teaching points in a way that didn't leave my, my reader in, in a confused and frustrated state. <laughs> um, and needless to say, there is there are so many resources out there for, for writers and authors, and I appreciate that. But if you want one that changes not only how you write, but how you live and how you move in the world, under the incredible protective wings <laughs> of AJ and her incredible Dean of Students, Laura Stone. This I encourage you to check out because it is a journey of joy rather than one of fear and panic and being lost. And it's an opportunity to really know what it is that you think. I loved going through this process. So I highly encourage you to check it out for yourself. And if you'd like to have um, uh, some opportunities to explore your creativity more in a hands-on way, I have a master class that I teach a couple of times a year. We just finished up with one cohort and it was another mind-blowing experience. My entrepreneur clients who come into this class are not quite sure how doing these um, practices of sketching and painting and poetry and all kinds of other creative acts, how that in the, how in the world is that going to impact their business? And what 
invariably happens is, is that new programs are born, new clay, new opportunities come, and it's all because of accessing and um, your creativity through art making, through that last M, making something. So if you want to check it out, it's called the Sketchbook Entrepreneur Masterclass, and my website is innovationandcreativityinstitute.com. And um, finally, um, before we go into that last little wrap up, let me see. I don't think we have any questions. Um, I want to um, encourage you to uh, take a look at your bookstore, your favorite bookstore, and see on the shelves. <laughs> This one will be coming soon, next Tuesday. This one's on the shelves now. Um, or Amazon or Barnes & Noble, wherever you buy your books. I really hope that um, you will take a look at both of our works. They are written from definitely from the position of reader first with enormous amounts of respect and love and, and desire to take you on a transformational journey for sure. Um, AJ, before we close, do you have any other final thoughts? I, I just that I think I want to say something more about buoyant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's because I didn't, I am the biggest skeptic in the world about this process. Uh, and it, I think it comes from all of these uh, different self-help and business books I've written over my career. but you have really tapped into something magical. It doesn't seem like a straight line. We're so focused on the ROI of everything that I think we forget about magic and spark and, and, and what lights us up. And your process to me is truly unique. And I can't recommend it enough for people who are truly, truly stuck and nothing that uh, they've tried seems to really work. It's, um, you, you gave me so you really challenged me and gave me so much to think about. And, um, and I, I believe that this works in a way your, your process works in a way that is, um, deeply personal and, uh, no one has to fit into a box to make it work. It's all just coming from you because you're making stuff and exploring what's interesting to you. That's what I love about it. So um, I just wanted to plug that because <laughs> and, and she didn't ask me to, but it, to me, reading that book was a revelation for me. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. I mean, she's, you should see her comments from her other editors and so forth. And I, I strongly encourage everyone watching to get your copy ASAP. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. So I want to close with um, a quote from a gentleman by the name of Charlie Kaufman. And he is a novelist and also a filmmaker. You might um, know him from the movie that he did called Adaptation. Um, and I talk about um, one scene of that particular movie in my book. But I love this quote so much. And he says, say who you are. Really say it in your life and in your work. Tell someone out there who is lost, someone not yet born, someone who won't be born for 500 years. Your writing will be a record of your time. It can't help but be. But more importantly, if you're honest about who you are, you'll help that person be less lonely in their world because that person will recognize him or herself in you. Three cheers for Charlie Kaufman. <laughs> AJ, thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you for all of your incredible mentorship and guidance and love and support. There is nobody else like you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you all. Bye-bye.